2013, a young woman by the name of Elisa Lam disappeared while on a trip to Los Angeles, California. Weeks later, she was found inside of a water tank on the roof of the Cecil Hotel. To this day, the exact circumstances surrounding her death are unknown. This podcast series examines the life and death of Elisa Lam. Many people are familiar with the disappearance and death of Elisa Lam. Though Elisa's eventual fate is clearly known, the circumstances surrounding it are not. The mystery behind what happened to Elisa is both confounding and tragic. On one hand, we have all the elements of a captivating story. A young, pretty girl leaves the safety and security of her home in Canada to travel to the United States, only to disappear suddenly and inexplicably. On the other hand, we have a multi-dimensional mystery with seemingly endless layers of detail, some of those details being fact, some conjecture, and some, quite simply, are just bizarre. To understand what happened, though, we must build a foundation of knowledge, and to the extent possible, separate what is fiction from what is fact. And that's what I will do over the course of this series, though I admit it has not proven to be an easy task. Before I begin with telling Elisa's story, I will give you some background information about why I decided to do this series. I first became aware of Elisa Lam when I was watching YouTube videos late one night in January of 2015. I was having trouble sleeping and did what is probably the last thing a person should do when they can't sleep, and that is watch creepy videos about disturbing unsolved mysteries. I had never heard the name Elisa Lam before, but the story caught my full attention immediately as it seems to do with a lot of people that come across it. The more information I uncovered while researching what happened, the more intrigued with it all I became. So I spent time gathering information in an attempt to figure out what happened to Elisa. It seemed that no matter how much new information I acquired, I was no closer to understanding the circumstances of her death. Initially, I didn't fully realize that to understand how and why a person died, you must closely examine how they lived. I would go for a while without thinking about Elisa, especially when responsibilities in my own life became more and more demanding. But then, seemingly out of nowhere, I would again start to think about what happened to her. I felt troubled by the lack of resolution. I felt haunted by it, or rather, her. This is how it has been for me for over two years now. Over the course of time spent examining the case, I have come across news articles, court documents, videos, blogs, and podcasts that try to tell what happened to Elisa. However, I rarely come across anything that examines it from a truly human perspective, and I think that's what's needed here to fully understand what happened to her. Over the years, I kept having this recurring urge to tell other people about Elisa, not just about her death, but about all of the mysterious circumstances surrounding it. And I tried to do this, though I must admit it felt like kind of an odd topic to broach with people outside of the realm of the internet. I told some family members, friends, co-workers, and even a work client or two to see what their reactions would be and to get their perspective on it all. However, I couldn't find anyone in what Elisa would have described as my real life that was particularly interested. I had a hard time understanding this because my thought was, how could someone else not want to know exactly what happened? It was just so strange and so intriguing. If so many people were willing to discuss it online, then where are all these people in the offline world? When I couldn't successfully engage anyone to examine and discuss it all with me, I turned back to the internet. Because on the internet, there are plenty of people interested in the case. I read what other people wrote on websites, article comments, and discussion boards. While it was fascinating to read what others had to say, I still felt I was missing a lot of important pieces to the puzzle. I needed more information, and so I set about the task of finding it. I couldn't shake the thought that I needed to tell Lisa's story, though. I wanted to share the information I had accumulated, and instead of forcing my opinions on others, I wanted to see what conclusions people would draw from the same information, and perhaps also information they had that I didn't, or still don't. The main problem was my limitations as far as what kind of medium I might use to tell Elisa's story. I'm not a documentary filmmaker, and I'm certainly not going to try to become one now. I'm not a radio or podcast producer. I can write, though, so it crossed my mind that I could write a blog series. 
However, I felt that something like that would get lost out there in the vast sea of already existing blogs. This is how I would talk myself out of doing anything at all, and it worked for almost two years. Eventually, that kind of rationalization stopped working for me, though, and I realized I might as well do a podcast. In hindsight, I was a little naive about it all. How hard could it be to make a podcast, I thought. I would write the content and then record it. Simple, right? Well, like so many things in life, it turns out it's not as easy as it looks. Putting together this podcast has been one of the most time-consuming projects I've taken on outside of school and work. I can't promise you it will be good or even interesting, but I can promise you it will be detailed. Now, when I refer to this as a case, it is really just a means of referring to a collection of explained and unexplained occurrences. But what I really want to stress here is that the heart of this story is a young woman who was only a few years into her adult life when she died. She was dynamic and a person with hopes, fears, and desires. She had a family that loved and cared about her. She had friends. She had a life. And then suddenly, she didn't anymore. She was gone. For Elisa's family, this story is heart-wrenching. It's not a story or a mystery or even a case. It's a nightmare. It is every parent's absolute worst nightmare. A horrific loss. Their daughter is gone, ripped from their lives before anyone even had a chance to find out the kind of person she might become as she settled into adulthood. Her family almost certainly has questions about the circumstances surrounding that loss that cannot easily be answered. I don't know Elisa's family, but my heart goes out to them. It is this empathy, I believe, that ultimately motivated me to take this project on and stick with it. If you're listening to this podcast, then there's a pretty good chance you know little or maybe even a lot about the case. I will first give you a chronological account of what happened to Elisa, and then later delve deeper into the various aspects of the narrative. With regard to piecing everything together into a cohesive and coherent narrative, I have to point out that one of the more frustrating barriers to accomplishing this is that there is a lot of misinformation floating around the web. I have at times found it difficult to trace the origin of various details about the case. I have a method in how I approach something like this that usually works for me, but it has limitations. I begin by searching for all of the information I can find about a case or an event. After that, I begin the tedious, if not daunting, task of determining the original source of the information. Granted, I know that even when a source can be determined, making that determination does not confirm the information as fact. The information can still be wrong, and some of it is still open to interpretation. Some of it is incomplete. I try to fill the gaps by looking for ways to obtain more information, whether it be through public records requests, contacting original sources of information, or finding somewhat out-of-the-box ways to obtain more details because I have this belief that the devil is in the details. The details, after all, make up the much larger picture. I also believe that even with remaining gaps, if one has enough of the smaller details, a fairly clear image of the overall picture will begin to emerge. And with that said, I will now begin the telling of the events surrounding Elisa's disappearance and death. Elisa Lam was born in Vancouver in British Columbia, Canada on April 30th of 1991. In January of 2013, she was 21 years old and lived with her parents, David and Nina Lam. Her parents had immigrated to Canada from Hong Kong. At the time of Lisa's disappearance and death, her father was the owner of Paul's Restaurant in Burnaby, BC. The restaurant specialized in homestyle Canadian and Chinese food. Elisa spoke fluent English, Cantonese, and some French. She was 5'4 and weighed approximately 120 pounds. She had a sister named Sarah, and the two shared a common interest in fashion. The timeline of events for this story begins with a trip Elisa took to the United States in the winter of 2013. Elisa was a student at the University of British Columbia with an interest in psychology, but she was not registered for classes at the time she planned her trip. She had been struggling while attending the university to consistently get to her classes and follow through with completing a term. She would often begin courses only to withdraw from them when she missed too many classes. She was acutely aware that the behavior was jeopardizing her ability to obtain a degree, but she believed she lacked the motivation she needed to take the steps necessary for reaching graduation. Part of this might have been because she did not seem certain about what it was she wanted to do with her life. She was preoccupied with making progress and she judged herself against her peers 
who appeared to maintain a steadier pace in fulfilling expectations. The further behind Elisa felt that she was, the more distressing the prospect of catching up became. She had trouble breaking free of the traditional expectations of young adults in first world countries, graduating from high school, attending college, graduating from college, beginning a career, and becoming completely self-reliant. She only saw this path and did not seem ready to consider possible alternatives. Her difficulty in getting a degree at the university had nothing to do with her intelligence. Elisa was extremely smart, and she also had a reasonably high degree of emotional intelligence that would have eventually served her well in life had she lived long enough to benefit from it. She had done very well in high school, a reality that weighed on her because it was a constant reminder that she had the academic ability to succeed, but could not break free of emotional obstacles standing in her way. Elisa had an ongoing struggle with depression and generalized anxiety disorder, and though those in her day-to-day life knew about this, they did not fully understand she could not just decide to overcome it. Depression and anxiety do not come with an on-off switch that those with the disorders may choose to operate at times of their choosing. For some, challenges with depression and anxiety are short-term, but for others, it can turn into a lifelong condition. Depression is much more common than most people realize. Statistics given with regard to the condition are high, but they are likely misleading as depression is also a source of immense shame for many experiencing it. Not all people open up about their symptoms or seek assistance in managing them. Chronic depression is not always perceived as a legitimate health condition, and so it is not looked upon as something that requires treatment of various kinds to manage. It is sometimes viewed by people as a weakness. The sad fact is, the misconception about it being a weakness is not just held by some who don't have it, but is also held by many that do. Elisa did not hide her condition from others. She was honest about its existence with those around her and with herself. It was, understandably, a source of frustration for her, though. She did not feel as though those closest to her in proximity really appreciated just how little control she had over it. This is not to say she had psychotic breakdowns or anything of the sort. By her own account, she didn't and hadn't. Instead, it just means that her depression and anxiety was a regular part of her life. She wasn't always sad. She wasn't always discouraged. She didn't always feel alone. But when she did feel this way, it was made harder because she wanted and needed more emotional support than she felt that she got. She also seemed to want acceptance. Acceptance and acknowledgement that her anxiety and depression did not define her but rather was just a small part of her, much like a person's eye or skin color. Sure, people can always change certain physical and mental characteristics temporarily, but in doing so, they must accept they are presenting an image to others that isn't real in the process. Authenticity was extremely important to Elisa. She was who she was. For her, it wasn't about rebelling or being different for the sake of nonconformance. It was about making meaningful connections with other people, and living life that had genuine value. This is an impossible task if a person cannot or will not show themselves to others as they really are. And in this way, Elisa was ahead of many other people her age because she was, above all, honest with herself. Elisa's trip to the United States was not her first. She had been to the U.S. before, and so the concept of traveling to locations far from home was not a new one to her. She went to San Francisco during Christmas in 2010, and she also took a trip to New York in the summer of 2011. Just prior to her trip to California, Elisa had traveled about Ontario. In the years prior to 2013, Elisa longed to travel without being accompanied by family. She spoke about this sometimes. She wanted to venture out into the world on her own, independently. Even though she had been to California before, Elisa was excited at the prospect of returning. She initially planned to see at least seven cities while on what she described on her Tumblr site as her West Coast tour. On January 5th, she wrote, Meetup applications now accepted for Vancouver, San Diego, Los Angeles, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, Santa Cruz, San Jose, and San Francisco. Suggestions and recommendations highly, highly appreciated and needed. Elisa had a habit of asking for recommendations from those connected to her social media accounts particularly when she planned to travel. Just before her trip to New York, for instance, she asked readers of her blog to make recommendations regarding places to eat. The request for meetup applications is an interesting one. It makes me wonder, did anyone take her up on this request? 
Did she have any accounts on sites geared toward giving people the opportunity to meet others, like meetup.com? I also wonder if the hotel she stayed at during the Los Angeles leg of her trip, the Cecil Hotel, was recommended to her by someone. It isn't completely clear to me why she selected this particular hotel. Even a brief review of information about the hotel would have revealed some of its history, potentially giving any traveler pause about staying there. But then again, its history is probably one of its biggest draws for some people. That and its relatively low room rates. Some choose a Cecil without any real knowledge about its background and reputation. Others choose it without really considering the dangers that potentially lurk outside the hotel. Without more information about what attracted Elisa to the hotel, one may only speculate about why she selected it or who, if anyone, may have recommended it. I also want to mention there's a possibility that when Elisa booked her reservations to stay at the hotel, she didn't realize that the hostel portion known as Stay is actually a part of the Cecil Hotel. In 2013, locals understood this, but those traveling from afar were less likely to know. The hostel and the hotel were marketed somewhat differently, and so it wasn't unusual for people planning a trip to think stay was merely part of the same building. Some booked their trip without any inkling they were staying at the infamous Cecil Hotel, former home to at least two serial killers. As far as the hotel's location in Los Angeles, Elisa was probably drawn to the area in general because of how close it was to LA's fashion district. Elisa had a passion for this kind of thing. She enjoyed spending time reading fashion blogs online. In 2010, she started a blog called Other Fields on Blogspot, where she was frequently posting pictures of designer clothing, hats, bags, and shoes. She continued with this blog until the middle of 2012, By that time, Elisa discovered she preferred Tumblr, another online social media site that she had been using. She made her final blogspot post on July 27th of 2012, indicating she was much more active on her Tumblr account. Her Tumblr was under the name of Nouvelle Nouveau. Eventually, Elisa's interest in fashion would become a point of contention in her own mind. Between that and the time she spent on Tumblr, she recognized that indulging these interests was holding her back. She didn't want a career in fashion and even seemed at odds with the aesthetic appeal it had to her and her beliefs about mass product consumption. To Elisa, there was a line between appreciating design and becoming overly concerned with using it to craft an identity, or an image rather. It's worth also mentioning that the CISO Hotel may have appealed to Elisa because it was located several blocks from a metro station, making it reasonably easy for someone staying there to travel about the city. Elisa was accustomed to using public transportation, and so having access to it would have been important to her. There's a second reason why some people avoid the Cecil Hotel, and it isn't related to its colorful past. The Cecil is situated in part of LA that is considered dangerous. It borders a particularly rough part of the city known as Skid Row. It's important to remember, though, that the Cecil was, and still is, located in what many consider the heart of the city. And so, for those unfamiliar with the layout, the location might have seemed optimal from a traveler's perspective. It is all too easy for those unfamiliar with the city to forget the risks associated with being there. On January 9th, Elisa wrote a post in her Tumblr account that she was feeling very low. She didn't go into detail about why she felt that way. She had a habit of documenting her ups and downs. Sometimes she would describe her thoughts, feelings, and experiences in detail, but other times she would simply write a sentence or two to record her moods. In this post, she added a little more information and indicated she had privatized her Facebook page. This wasn't the first time she did this. Facebook almost seemed a necessary evil to Elisa. It allowed her to stay connected with other people, but it also made her feel vulnerable. It was one thing for her to share her innermost thoughts and feelings on social media, where she could remain nearly anonymous on some sites but it was another to do this to the extent that she did with people she knew really well. When she got to feeling down, she had a tendency to close herself off from those around her. This was true even when she expressed a need to talk to someone else about how she was feeling. She was honest about her experiences with depression on a broad level with those she knew well, but much more so with those she didn't. She was a self-described introvert, but was possibly viewed by some as an extrovert due to her desire to travel, experience new things, and meet new people. 
Despite this openness to the world around her, introversion was still a true primary characteristic of her personality though, because as honest as she was with herself, and though she did not feel accountable to online, she was at times her own biggest obstacle to receiving the understanding and empathy she so often needed from those in her life outside of the internet. She understood people at a level that is unattainable for most, but she herself felt misunderstood. This was hard for her to accept. She wanted more than that. It bothered her that so many people were content with somewhat superficial lives and connections. She wondered why there were not more people like herself, easily accessible outside of the internet setting. On the 14th, Elisa confessed there was a guy she was interested in. This would happen to her from time to time. Suddenly, she would talk about a new person she liked, and she would wonder if that person had an interest in her as well. She was not generally shy about these things and could be assertive when it came to those she considered potential romantic prospects, boyfriend material, if you will. She would get to the point where she would make her feelings known to the person and then learn, for better or worse, if they felt the same way. Sometimes they did, and sometimes they didn't. Elisa took rejection hard, but she was resilient in that she didn't let past rejection stop her from trying to seize present or future opportunities. In the middle of December of 2012, Elisa's boyfriend of over a year asked for a break. In a matter of days, the requested break turned into a break up. It turned out he wanted to get back together with his ex-girlfriend. Even though the relationship had been long-term, Elisa seemed to take it pretty well. Though she only wrote about it on a limited basis, she spoke about her ex-boyfriend in a positive way and indicated she would miss hanging out with him. She thought it likely the two would remain good friends. She was single once again and seemed willing to turn her attention to new interests. The person she described on her Tumblr in mid-January of 2013 was a musician. She said she realized she liked him after their second meeting, citing four reasons why. First, he played the double bass. Second, he wore bow ties and suspenders. Third, he played L4D. And finally, he had an adorable smile. L4D stands for Left for Dead. It's a zombie apocalypse survival game that came out in 2008. A second version came out shortly thereafter. Elisa liked to play video games. She played everything from Zelda to Halo to Portal. As a child, she had not been allowed to have her own gaming console, and so she was excited to finally get the chance to play all of the games she missed out on. Months earlier, she talked about staying at a friend's house, where the two played Halo. She found out her friend was interacting online with a group of 14-year-old boys. Elisa wasn't sure what to make of the situation after hearing the boys make what she described as racist, homophobic, and otherwise disparaging comments while gaming. She wrote, and for no apparent reason, they insist on talking in a cookie monster voice. I don't know what she talks to them about, but I guess they're harmless and she simply doesn't want to face anything serious. Still, it's weird. She says it makes her happy to talk to them. On the following day, Elisa talked about her personality and listed traits she felt were negative. She would do this sometimes, take inventory, so to speak. She said she typically spoke in a manner that was loud and unfiltered, writing, I'm fine if I don't open my mouth, but as soon as I do and start talking, I can get in trouble because people hear what I say out of context and immediately get offended. Elisa went on to give opinions on race and culture and the impact they have on individual identity. She described this in the context of trying to explain that she wasn't making comments or judgments with the intention of offending people or coming across as intolerant. At one point, she wrote, My mouth is my downfall and it will get me in trouble. I already do so many stupid things. I have trouble knowing where the boundaries are, and it seems I always make the biggest mistakes at the worst possible moments, and get caught and face consequences for getting caught the one time I wasn't thinking and did something stupid to cut corners. Just prior to leaving, Elisa had a party. Friends attended, and it had a positive effect on her mood. On that day, in her Tumblr account, she wrote the following, I had a catch-up reunion with high school elementary people and a sort of bon voyage soiree, and I'm fatigued, exhausted, in recovery for throwing it, and just seeing so many people and doing so many stupid, idiotic things in the last four days. But I am so very full of, I suppose the term would be as Dumbledore says, love, because last night was evidence that I do have amazing, beautiful things in my life, and even though everyone is busy and going off doing great things, they do care about me. 
I'm not a profession depressed person. I am so much more than that, and these people are my reminders that I'm very lucky. Life is long and difficult, and people will always be stupid and complain, but it is worth it so long as you have special moments. There will be a lot of these moments in the future, and there have been a lot in the past. So what if everything is shit and all the plans have gone to hell? If I ask for help, someone might even be willing to spare a hand. Thank you, friends, family, and Tumblr. On January 22nd, Elisa posted to Tumblr that she was too tired to pack. She must have completed her packing soon after, because later on the same day she wrote about getting lost in an airport and missing her connecting flight. She had to sleep at the airport, but noted that it could be worse. She also added that United Airlines provides blankets, and at least she had access to Wi-Fi. Two days later, on the 24th, Elisa posted to her Tumblr while in San Diego, writing that she hadn't done anything there that was outside of her normal routine, and said her day was most productive and enjoyable. She had the freedom to do what she wanted, and she could exercise that right by sticking to her usual routine and comfort zone, or she could do something impulsive, such as tell a guy she just met that she liked him. She commented that she liked to people watch and closed her post by writing that she should venture outside more. She listed some possible activities, such as going to SeaWorld, the zoo, the museum, or whale watching. Two more days went by before Elisa posted an update in her own words. On the 26th, she wrote, I'm going out tonight. I really hope no creeper comes near me. Seriously, though, those Italian and Mexican guys go after you strong. Show the slightest inclination, and they hound you. Elisa added a tag to her post that said she wanted to listen to some live jazz. It was not clear, based on the date and information contained in her post, if she had yet made it to Los Angeles. A couple of days had passed since she last posted to her account, but it was possible she was still in San Diego or that she had stopped somewhere else. During the planning phase of her trip, she provided a list of places she wanted to visit, listing San Diego first and Los Angeles second. She did not indicate on her Tumblr that she had any intention of stopping somewhere else and so she was either likely in San Diego or L.A. It's just difficult to determine which city she was in at the time. News articles published after she was reported missing say she was already in L.A. An article by The Guardian gave January 26 as her arrival date in Los Angeles, and the Vancouver Sun did this as well, just to name two. But the media is only as accurate as their sources, and so the question then became, who did the media get this information from? The main reason why determining where Elisa was in the days leading up to her disappearance is important is because knowing where she was on each day can help us piece together the places she went and potentially people she came in contact with. On January 27th, Elisa tweeted one word entirely in capital letters that read, Speakeasy. It is timestamped on Twitter as having been posted at 12.57 a.m. Later, she followed up on her blog and wrote, the speakeasy was awesome, except I lost a cell phone. Sigh. She gave a little more detail in the tag of her post, saying, And it's not even mine. It's my friend's old Blackberry that he's lending to me. Well, not lend. He doesn't want it anymore, but... Stupid. Elisa does not state who the friend was, when he gave it to her, how long she had the phone, or anything else about it. Misplacing cell phones was a problem for Elisa. She did it a lot but would often locate the missing phone later on. It was never made clear whether or not she found this one. On January 29th, a Tuesday, Elisa posted a new update to her Tumblr page and said, I have arrived in LA land, and there is a monstrosity of a building next to the place I'm staying. When I say monstrosity, mind you, I'm saying as in gaudy. But then again, it was built in 1928, hence the Art Deco theme, so yes, it is classy. But then, since it's L.A., it went on crack. So here's where the timeline gets confusing. Why does Elisa say on the 29th she arrived in L.A. as though she hasn't already been there for several days? Here we go again with the question about which city she was in just prior. At this point, we have the benefit of hindsight, and so we know what the police believed then regarding her arrival date thanks to their releases of information. However, even now, with the benefit of further information to assist in developing a timeline, the matter of exactly when Elisa arrived in L.A. remains unclear. It really comes down to what sources of information you believe, because the sources are not consistent across the board. The media reported that she arrived on the 26th, 
But if that's true, then where did she stay for two nights before checking into the Cecil? I ask this question because hotel records appear to contradict information spread throughout the media. The general manager of the Cecil Hotel, Amy Price, stated in a declaration that was part of a civil suit brought by Elisa's parents against the hotel that Elisa booked reservations to stay at the hotel with an arrival date of January 28th and a departure date of January 31st. Perhaps the strangest thing about the inconsistency regarding her arrival date at the hotel is that no one seemed to know precisely where she was between the dates of January 26th and 27th. You would think that out of everyone, the people that would be most likely to know where Elisa was, and when, were her parents. She had been in daily contact with them until the 31st. As far as the media was concerned, the source of information giving the 26th as her arrival date in L.A. was the Los Angeles Police Department, or LAPD for short. In a news release dated February 6 of 2013, the police department wrote the following. A young woman, 21-year-old Elisa Lam, from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, arrived in Los Angeles nearly two weeks ago on January 26 and hasn't been seen since January 31st. Her reason for traveling in the state was unclear, but her final destination was apparently in Santa Cruz, California. It is also known that she tends to use public transportation, such as Amtrak and municipal buses. If Elisa was traveling in San Diego on the evening of the 26th and 27th, it means she went to a completely different speakeasy to listen to live music than she would have gone had she been in L.A. The speakeasy in L.A. is about a two-minute walk from the hotel. I say no one seemed to know because of the discrepancies in the timeline, but that does not mean her whereabouts were truly unknown. It just means if they were known to anyone, like her parents, for example, the information was not disclosed to the public. If the police knew, they were not sharing that information either, though their early communications with the public, in which they stated her reasons for traveling in the state were unknown, suggest the police had very limited information. For now, I am going to put aside the LA arrival date issue. Just keep in mind, there are some question marks there, and potentially some gaps in Elisa's general travel timeline that could possibly, if closed, shed more light on what ultimately happened to her. Getting back to the timeline, the 29th is when Elisa made the announcement she was in L.A. via Tumblr. She referred to a monstrosity of a building next to where she was staying. Emphasis on the word next, because this tells you exactly where she was, and that was in the hostel and not the main Cecil Hotel. By 2013, the hostel made up one side, or portion, of the hotel, if one is standing in front of the hotel, the hostel is on the left. The stay and the Cecil are parts of a single hotel, but they are sometimes referred to as though they are not. One reason for the confusion, as I mentioned before, is that the two are marketed as separate entities. They seem to be branded differently. The accommodations were such that the hostel offered multi-person rooms containing bunk beds as well as private rooms. Those with a private room typically had their own bathroom, and those in the multi-person rooms shared a bathroom at the end of the hall. Those staying at the hostel had the option to use Cecil's elevator. In a future episode, I will go into more detail about the history of the Cecil Hotel, but for now, you should know, if you don't already, that the hotel didn't just house those traveling on a short-term basis. The hotel was also a long-term residence to a fair number of people as well. Some had lived at the hotel for decades by 2013. Some longer-term residents had already come and gone. These days, before booking a hotel, many people turn to the internet for ideas or further information. An array of websites contain reviews people have written after staying in a hotel. This gives those considering whether or not a particular hotel is a viable option an idea of what they might expect if they were to stay there as well. Reading online reviews is not always the best way to make this kind of decision, but sometimes it's the only resource a person has, especially if they are traveling to a place they have never been and do not know anyone else who has ever stayed there. I was curious about what people who had actually stayed at the hostel thought of it, and so I went through online reviews, starting with Yelp.com. There aren't many posted on the site around the time Elisa went missing. On January 21st, one person wrote a review, giving the hostel portion of the hotel 3 out of 5 stars. 
saying the hostel was geared towards attracting younger travelers. The person wrote, Stay was not only the cheapest hotel, but the best bang for your buck, and they advised readers to ignore the complainers. Little did the reviewer know that within several weeks of writing this review, people would have good reason to complain, and it would be about something far more sinister than the common complaints plaguing both the hostel and the hotel prior to February of 2013. On February 3rd of 2013, a person identified as Kung K from Torrance, California, lamented over the fact that no visitors are allowed in the rooms. Kung wanted to have a few friends over to visit, but could only meet with them at the hotel's main lobby. One of Kung's friends complained to the front desk, and the argument escalated when staff seemed unsympathetic. The friend was apparently escorted out by security and told that if they entered the hotel again, the police would be called. I can't always tell from reading the reviews what date or dates each person stayed there, and so all I can do is go by the date the review was published and the content within the review itself. Kung seemed to have stayed at the hostel around the same time that Elisa went missing, but it is unclear if it was before, during, or just after. I'm not making this observation to suggest Kung had anything at all to do with her disappearance, but rather to point out the date of the review shows the individual was there before Elisa was officially reported missing. That means the strict no-visitor policy was in place before her disappearance and was not instituted after in response to it. And by this reviewer's account, the hostel was pretty strict about enforcing it. Anyway, Kung Lee gave the hotel one star out of five. I think one star is the lowest rating the site will allow. Otherwise, I suspect some reviewers might have opted to give it zero stars. Not all people felt this way, though. On February 21st, another person posted a review by the name of Adrix C. from Scottsdale, Arizona. Adrix was a little more forgiving in her rating, giving the hotel 2 out of 5 stars. She admitted originally having some concerns about staying at the hotel after reading reviews, but because of where it is situated, she decided to, and I'm quoting her words here, give it a try anyways. She indicated one problem with staying at the hotel was the noise saying that guests could hear everything going on, whether it be outside, in other rooms, and in the halls. Her biggest complaint, however, was what she referred to as baby roaches. She claimed she saw them on the walls, carpets, and in the closets of the room she stayed in. Adrix didn't seem to know anything about Elisa's disappearance, even though the entry is dated on the 21st of February. A traveler from Honolulu, Hawaii, posted a review dated March 14th of 2013. This person liked the hotel for the most part, giving it 4 out of 5 stars. The reviewer spoke at length about the pros and cons of staying at the hotel, but did not once mention Elisa or any unusual occurrences involving the hotel. On March 19th, Carol Ann G. gave the hotel 1 out of 5 stars, saying she didn't even last long enough after check-in to spend the night. She seemed to feel tricked into staying at the Cecil, unaware initially that the hostel was part of the hotel and that the two shared an elevator. She made a vague mention of the hotel's horror stories, saying that she did not even become aware of the hotel's past until she mentioned she was staying at the hostel to her tour agent. It seemed he wasn't that supportive of her choice. And she had an incident with the elevator as well. She wrote, By mistake, I took the lift to the wrong floor and it reeked of the smell of urine. Carol Ann closed by saying the corridor felt eerie and the room was cold due to a lack of heat. This got me to thinking, who would be the first of the reviewers on the site to mention the most recent unfortunate event or series of events to befall the hotel in 2013? So I kept reading to find out. Kiersey M. published a review dated March 20th. She did not mention Elisa or the hotel's not-so-pleasant past. She gave it 3 out of 5 stars. Ten days later, Orlando L. posted a review and gave the hostel 5 out of 5 stars. He loved it there, said it was close to what he described as fun bars and fun peeps. Orlando closed his short review by recommending that if travelers, quote, want a good social experience, this is the place to stay. All I can really say to that is, I guess it all depends on a person's idea of a good social experience. The wide fluctuation in the ratings show that opinions about the hostel and hotel differ significantly, and it is all quite relative. 
Finally, I found what I was looking for. A review was published on April 3rd by a man from San Diego, California. He was not so enamored with the hostel. He wrote in what I assume was a regretful tone. I didn't know it shares rooms with Cecil Hotel, which had murder recently. We had to share bath and restroom with others. Unbelievable. I wish I had canceled and were able to get the refund. Very bad experience. Some reviews illustrated a fair number of people that stayed at the hostel did not fully realize it was part of the Cecil Hotel. I decided to leave the stays review page and head over to the Cecil Hotels, as there were separate pages for each. It was interesting, if not amusing, to read what those who had stayed at the Cecil Hotel had to say about it. Within the depths of the reviews, I think I found some answers to questions I had, but not necessarily the ones I really wanted. Monique H. published a review on January 10th of 2013, writing, Awful place. Just got escorted out by security because I was visiting a friend in a room. Apparently, there's no visitors allowed any time. After reading Monique's review, I had to wonder if she was the one Kung referred to in an earlier February review of Stay. Either that, or visitors getting escorted out of the hotel by security was commonplace enough to have happened at least twice in a reasonably short time frame. Who's to say, though? This is downtown LA we're talking about here. Another review was published by Jim Luther D. on February 20th. In a nutshell, he liked the hotel. He liked the staff. He described his stay as exceptional, despite deducting one star from his otherwise positive review. He said this was because he didn't have a balcony from which he could gaze at city views. Another review I came across, published on February 23rd by Hunter C., was interesting. He gave the hotel 4 out of 5 stars also. He especially liked that he could brush his teeth and take a shower at the same time due to what he called the sink-shower combo. He liked the staff and the architecture. Then his review took a turn in another direction, and he wrote, and to address the dead body incident. Can you guys get over it? Think of it like an active history lesson. The ancient civilization, the Patas of Sumatra, would consider devouring human flesh to be an exquisite delicacy. I think he was referring to the Batak of Sumatra, but I can't be sure. Somehow I don't think Hunter's comparison would have been comforting to those that stayed at the hotel during the first half of February in 2013. Hunter concluded his review by pointing out that he deducted one star because in his words, I realize that most people will find this recent news to be quite strange, but like I always say, if the water's brown, you're in the wrong side of town. This last statement, in conjunction with all of his other statements, suggests Hunter C. did not mind being on the wrong side of town, especially if it was in a hotel with a sink-shower combo. He never said precisely when he stayed at the hotel. I imagine he would have said something if he had been there between the time Elisa checked in and the time she was found. I say this because, based on his review, the most exciting thing that happened to him seemed to be his encounter with that sink-shower combo that he said was, quote, wildly interesting. TripAdvisor.com has reviews about the hotel, too. The good thing about TripAdvisor, compared to Yelp, is that information about the month, year, and reason for travel is provided below each review. On February 5th, Helen G. wrote the following about her stay in January of 2013. Let's just say that I had an issue with this hotel and afterward requested to speak to the manager on the phone. She was clearly unprofessional and said she'd call me back but never did after my repeated phone messages. These people left me feeling very frustrated. The hotel really is not in a good area either. You'd think they would try harder to please their guests. Needless to say, she only gave the hotel a 1 out of 5 rating, and again, I think that's the lowest anyone is allowed to give, or I got the sense she wouldn't have given it any stars at all. A reviewer by the name of Iris from Costa Rica published a review on February 25, 2013, in reference to her stay there that same month and year. She gave the hotel a 4 out of 5 rating. She seemed to believe that this stay or the Stay on Main, as it is also called, and the Cecil were two different hotels that merely shared a building. She had this to say about the hotel. When I was looking for a downtown hotel in Los Angeles while shopping wholesale at the Fashion District, I was intrigued to find both hotels so close. Well, they share the same 1920s building, 
but some floors are stay and some are Cecil. But the stay has a contemporary decor, new beds, and hardwood floor in the rooms, an equipped shared kitchen and laundry room for guests, younger even backpackers' guests, and even complimentary popcorn all day long at the lobby. The Cecil has an amazing lobby with marble and classic decor and a mezzanine where breakfast is served every morning for both hotels, but rooms are plain with rugs and some people rent weekly, monthly, and even live here. In both hotels, you can choose between private or shared bathroom, and location is convenient to take the metro, dash, and also when you arrive from the airport in flyaway long-distance bus. After reading the reviews about the Cecil and the stay, it seems as though people have completely contrasting experiences there. Either they perceived the place to be sketchy, filthy, and noisy, complete with unfriendly staff, or they thought it was a good bargain for the money, and clean, with friendly and helpful staff. There just wasn't a whole lot of middle ground as far as the reviews were concerned. It occurred to me that it was almost as though the hotel had two faces, or rather, two different personalities, a kind of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde type of deal. Elisa's stay at the hotel began at the hostel. She stayed in a shared room with other guests, room 506, bed B. Her time spent in the shared room was limited, though, according to the Cecil's manager. Others staying in the shared room complained about her behavior, and as a result, she was moved to a private room located on the same floor, room 511. I will talk about this in more detail at a later time, but suffice it to say, she did not spend all of her time at the hotel in the same room. The 29th of January was the last day Elisa published a text post on her Tumblr page that did not consist of a reblogging of something from another person's account. It was a post written in her own words. The distinction is important because images and quotes would continue to post on her page for almost one year after she died. Some believe that is because Tumblr makes it possible for those with accounts to schedule posts to show up on their page on a set date and time in the future. For those unfamiliar with Tumblr, here's how it generally works. A person with a Tumblr account has two primary means of posting updates to the page. The first option is to upload content or write a text entry and then post it directly. The second option is to reblog or reshare content another Tumblr member has posted. Both options allow the person blogging to schedule a time and date in the future for the content to post if they don't want to share it immediately. This feature makes it difficult to ascertain whether or not Elisa was responsible for the account continuing to post long after she died. A determination that Elisa did not schedule the content to reblog on her Tumblr could be made if even one reblog could be traced to original content posted after she disappeared. In other words, Elisa couldn't have scheduled specific content to reblog in the future if the content was originally shared after her death. She wouldn't have been alive to see it or to set her account up to repost it. During her trip, Elisa kept in contact with her family daily. The last date of contact, according to the police and various media, was January 31st. No information was given about the last conversation she had with her parents or what time of day it occurred. CTV British Columbia reported that Elisa was last seen on January 31st by hotel staff. In a news clip about the disappearance, NBC4 also described Elisa as last being seen by hotel staff, except this news outlet specified it was only one employee that saw her. No further information about this last sighting was provided. On the 31st of January, Elisa made a stop at the last bookstore, a little over a quarter of a mile away from the hotel. The store's manager, Katie Orphan, described her interaction with Elisa to CNN after her disappearance. Katie seemed to remember it well. Elisa had come into the store and purchased records, as well as some other presents, for her sister and parents. She described Elisa as very outgoing, lively, and friendly. She said she talked with Elisa about the books she was getting and about whether they would be too heavy to travel with. The manager would later tell CBS Los Angeles that it seemed like Elisa had plans to return home and that she had planned to give the items she bought at the store to her family once they all reconnected. Nothing about Elisa's demeanor seemed odd to Katie. It was on February 4th that Elisa's parents officially filed a missing persons report with the LAPD. 
Her sister, along with both parents, traveled to L.A. to get to the bottom of what happened and hopefully locate Elisa alive and well. The family did not speak to the press, but were cooperating with police. Their physical presence in L.A. likely helped to motivate the LAPD to take the disappearance seriously. This is not to say the LAPD would not have given it attention had the family not traveled to the city, but it does show the desperation the family felt with regard to their need to find Elisa. On February 6, the LAPD held a press conference to advise the public of Elisa's disappearance with the hope it might generate leads. Lieutenant Walter Teague stated during the conference that there was, quote, no prior history of any kind of behavior like this or any problems like this. During the conference, Elisa's sister, mother, and father were observed standing behind the lieutenant looking worried and upset. Elisa had already been missing for almost one week, and the situation looked bleaker and bleaker with each passing minute. The clock was ticking, and it was anyone's guess as to if, when, and where Elisa would be found. In the next episode of this podcast series, I will cover the LAPD's investigation into Elisa's disappearance and talk about the findings. I will also delve briefly into a situation that may have served as a distraction at the time. During nearly the first half of February, the LAPD had more than just a missing woman on their plate. They were on the hunt for a man responsible for killing four people, some of whom were law enforcement officers. The alleged perpetrator of the shootings had at one time been one of LAPD's own. The former officer deemed responsible for the deaths gave a lengthy breakdown explaining his motives behind the shootings, and the reasons he gave seemed to cast the LAPD in a terrible light. Thank you for listening to the Elisa Lamb podcast. If you have information you wish to share with me, please contact me at elisalampodcast at gmail.com. You may follow the podcast on Twitter at Elisa Lamb Podcast. The music in this podcast was composed by VYVCH and is titled In the Darkness, available for download on freemusicarchive.org and licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial 4.0 International License. More information about this license is found on creativecommons.org forward slash licenses.